Welcome to the next presentation on the Conscious Co-Creation Tools. And we're using the Conscious Co-Creation Tools as lenses to view self-organization. So here are our deeper advanced insights and our second presentation covering lenses, perceptions and inversions. And the hypothesis is that drama is caused by perceptions which are shaped by emotional programs. And the sound of music version is the one most people want, holding hands, skipping through the flowers. And the Mad Max version is the one that they usually create because they're two sides of the same coin. Equally, as Thomas Mann said, everything is politics. And if you view everything as politics, everything will be political. So as I said at the beginning in the first video, describing the conscious co-creation tools, Without effective intention, structure and process, the manifestations always look like politics, personality and ego, but they're not the root cause. So the big question is, do we create environments for these manifestations to flourish or do we simply deprive them of the oxygen needed for issues to multiply? So the aims of the presentation are to share experience and perspectives, to draw attention to critical issues and common errors, to offer deeper insights using a lens of conscious co-creation, to illustrate how things can go wrong and how to avoid them and the solutions, and in the process to highlight critical success and failure points and to draw attention to the dangers of inversions, which I'm defining as good people versus unwise decisions. So these are really important issues. We need to understand the dangers of tampering with the system and tampering from MOSO is translating specific circumstances into general responses, which are usually counterproductive, often taken against the firm views of their own specialist advisors. And the bottom line is this, what lens do we want to use? Personality and politics or structure and process? Deming said the big problems are where people don't realize they have one in the first place and learning is not compulsory, neither is survival. And Moso says examples without theory teach nothing. So let's use an example. An intention setting exercise. And the theory behind applied intention is to connect to an outcome which is already out there. It exists. This is quantum physics as applied by Joe Dispenza, Greg Braden, Lynn McTaggart, Bruce Lipton, etc. And the theory is that all quantum outcomes are possible and exist and that belief, hope, or wish for an outcome are therefore different outcomes. And the wording is critical because it connects to a discrete outcome, it acts as a reminder, it crystallizes intention, and it's a communications device. It's used to align new members. No words equals no alignment. So we need to lock down on the, on the interpretation of this as well and make sure it's absolutely simple and crystal clear because it's our guiding star to accompany our map, which is our processes and our structure, which is the ship. So the key steps, the criteria have been set, clarity and simplicity, an intended outcome that already exists is the definition. And there can be possible reactions from the group such as I'm not interested. I don't know anything about it. I don't believe in it. And a why statement is put forward as an alternative with a good theory. And I've experienced this. And the issue is, I quickly realized it was in my blind spot. I can't possibly understand why people don't know why they're doing things or why they forget. Nevertheless, the theory was that it creates a, an emotional connection with why people do things based on beliefs and hopes and wishes. So on that basis, it's not something I understand, but I can understand that the person putting it forward has a good theory and a good explanation. And so on that basis, the why statement makes sense and it's agreed. But what happened with intention was that it was selected on the basis of good copywriting not clarity or contents, and in fact, the contents were changed. So let's ask ourselves some questions now. 
What do you observe about the two processes? What do you observe regarding the differences in the outcomes? And this raises the question of how do we deal with expertise wisely? For example, how would you deal with lawyers, accountants or research scientists with particular knowledge, information or a specialist group or specialist knowledge in general? And my hypothesis is, well, yeah, it's possible to override them, but you do it with, I think, a great deal of discernment and care because you'd have to appreciate that these people know more about something than you do. They're interested in it and they know what it's about. Let's take another example now. The marketing team brings the results of a meeting to the core group and the explanation is that we decided to change the name and we've registered new URLs. And the rationale is given that four syllables or less in a name is desirable because it's more memorable and easy to say. There is a dissociation with Pleasant Rise, the community farm project, because it may be damaging to the brand if it fails. And three letter abbreviated URLs, such as PQR, are very expensive. Well, coming from expertise, that makes complete sense. Who can argue with that? If you're a marketing person, you might argue with it and you might put forward a reason for that. But if you're not, you can't possibly argue with it. And in fact, the point is not argument. It's about understanding. Because if we're using the wisdom of the crowd and the collective consciousness, then the theory that we have is that large groups consistently make better decisions than a small group or an individual. And that's because it's diverse and mathematical. It's independent. It's decentralized, so it means it has the experts, the independent experts, and the local knowledge or the specialist knowledge, and that is expertise in context. And it's structured. And there's more. There is theory behind this. So let's look at the fundamentals. We've got our process. We've got our compass. We have our structures. We have the circle within the circle. And we grow to create the flower of life. And in practice, what this means is that the smaller group always makes offerings to the bigger group or to the core team. And then if it's a community, then that offering or that suggestion goes out to the overall community. And we have processes, which is the applied collective consciousness. We have the circles, the energy circle, the listening circle and the action learning circle. And we have the Toltec principles. Be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions. Always do your best and be skeptical, but learn to listen. And we have our team agreements extended into take responsibility for yourself, for your actions, for your emotions and for dealing with team issues because a process only works if it, the team and the intention are supported. So we're talking about team decisions, not consensus, but we can try more than one option. And along the way, that means we have ways of dealing with conflict, ways of creating alignment. We have nonviolent communication. We have honest and open communication versus projection. And we have an intention of self-reflection and self-mastery versus command and control. And we have ways to deal with conflicts and groups on a group and a personal level. So let's assume that that uh, meeting then was followed up because that was a presentation of a decision that's been made rather than a recommendation. So let's assume this is followed up and the marketing person says marketing has decided we're the majority and we don't care what the group thinks, the core group. So as the chair then, that means that your conversation is about the processes and team agreements because there's a theory behind it. There is a particular way that it works and there's a reason behind it. We're going to explore this a little more deeply in this video. 
So at this point, it'd be very easy as the chair to go straight into a load of assumptions. The assumptions could be, well, maybe they don't know the processes. Maybe they don't understand the processes. Maybe they're viewing the processes as just unnecessary bureaucracy. Maybe they've got a control issue or they think I've got a control issue. Maybe there's a trust issue going on. Maybe there's a view of, well, we're the marketing people, we're the experts. How can you possibly disagree with us? And maybe it's just a misunderstanding. And it's useful to get all the assumptions out on the table because we don't know what the other person is assuming. But our job at this stage is to focus on the processes and the structures. And equally, the other person could be making assumptions about us. Maybe there's a misunderstanding about the processes and they say, well, you know, they shouldn't be applied like this or they don't work like this. Or maybe they think we've got control issues. Maybe they are viewing the processes as bureaucracy. Maybe they think, hey, we're the marketing team and you don't trust us. We're the experts. What have you got to contribute? Maybe they're also seeing a misunderstanding. But the fact is, we don't know. And although it's useful to bear in mind that there could be lots of different explanations for things, the fact is, we don't know. The only thing that we can go to is the team agreements and the processes. We need to be very aware in this situation of the potential to walk into the Hall of Mirrors, where people are just assuming and projecting on each other. That's why we always go back to the processes. And the fact is that the lens that we're using determines what we see and what we see determines our interpretation. And that's why it's really important not to make assumptions because ultimately we've got the potential on the one side to view everything as emotion, politics and personality. And what we need to be focusing on is the stuff that we've agreed upon, which is intention, structure and process. So this is how it should work. Marketing makes a presentation and they say there are too many syllables. This makes a weak brand. A three letter URL is very expensive and association with the Pleasant Rise Community Project means that there could be a risk. It means that because the names are so similar, if there are problems with the Pleasant Rise Community Project, it could reflect badly on the brand. And who could disagree with any of that? That's all reasonable thinking. It's all got a theory behind it as well. And it's also got experience and expertise. But that's not what the process is about. This is what the process is about. It means that people can put forward other suggestions like, well, we could call it pure quantum rise. They could say, well, it sounds to me like a three letter URL is not just expensive, but maybe it's expensive for a reason, which is it's premium, it's high value. And maybe on that basis, we could actually get a cheap URL with three letters through the blockchain. And we don't know whether one of these suggestions or one of these questions is gonna resonate with the marketing people. But if it does, then lights could pop on and they could say, oh yeah, actually hadn't thought of that. The next one is the person who does the elevator pitch might say, well, actually at the moment, Pleasant Quantum Rise works really well because I can tie in the green aspect to Pleasant, the gold of the quantum to the scalability and the gold DeFi, and I can tie in the purple of the rise to sovereignty, empowerment, free and open source information. And then I can tie all that lot together with the strap line from survivability to thriveability. So actually, if I was meeting an investor or a busy rich person where I've got to do a 30 second elevator pitch, at the moment I can deliver it effectively and I can do it in a way that I believe they're going to remember most of the gist of it and get it really quickly. And that's perhaps not gonna work so well if we've got another kind of name coming in where we're dropping elements out there. That actually creates a stumbling point for me. 
And another person could say, well, you know, what's the significance of three letters? Is there significance in the number three in marketing? Could that be something that's powerful and important? Why don't we play a little game, gamify the project, and everyone can write down organizations that are known by their initials, whether they're two, three, or four, and as many as possible in 30 seconds or a minute. And then we can see, my hypothesis is that we're gonna come up with a lot more three letter and number acronyms for organizations than two letter or four letter. And maybe there's some significance in that. Maybe there is significance, maybe there isn't, but the marketing people might be able to pick up on something like this. And maybe someone else might pitch in and say, well, actually I view the Pleasant Rise Farm as an opportunity because it's a prestige project in a national park. And on that basis, if it works out well, then we've got something that's supporting the brand, not undermining it. Perhaps we shouldn't make the assumption that it is going to fail. So in the process, what we're doing is we're tapping into all of the other knowledge outside the specific marketing domain maybe commercial, technologies, community, the single house, the DeFi, and the neutrals, people just coming in with basic questions to bring the assumptions out. And what it means is that there's no assumption of a hard and fast limitation of any domain within the organization, because the fact is that decisions like this can impact people and elements of the organization in a surprising way. So this is really leveraging the power of the collective consciousness in favor of the group. And it's not a, an undermining or a destructive process. It's a constructive process because ultimately, even if all the questions and all the suggestions are fielded by marketing and they say, no, there's no relevance in any of that, we think we've got something much better, then what we should have through the discussion process is a much better understanding, much more trust on all sides of the equation, and a better alignment. So in the process through using the team agreements, what we're doing is we are able to bring out the Emperor's New Clothes view, which is the naive basic questions like the child who questioned the Emperor and said, you've got no clothes on, and people coming from this position of neutrality with a blank canvas and a fresh perspective. And that means that that very lack of knowledge actually can open up outside the box suggestions and opportunities. Because if we're looking at something in a blinkered way or in a specialist way, then we don't necessarily look at it in other ways. And that also can unlock outside the box knowledge and opportunities. And the fact is, that the assumption here is that there's a porous domain. There is no border between one specialist group in an organization and another because we don't know how we're looking at things can create impacts and issues for other areas and domains. And one of our key tenets is don't make assumptions. So looking at it another way, the biggest group decides, first the core team, and then the whole community. And the fact is, if not, then what we're actually doing is we're rebuilding hierarchy. And the whole premise of we decide, and this is our territory, and butt out. So my conclusions are that this is an extremely valuable collective consciousness process. Um, and it relies on no assumption of a closed domain boundary. So it recognizes that there are no limits of interest and influence. And on that basis, it helps to avoid assumptions and mistakes. And if that's the negative way of looking at it, the positive way of looking at it is that it opens up wider creativity and possibilities of better solutions. And in fact, it enhances domain wealth instead of undermining it, providing it's done wisely. So this process unlocks the wisdom of the crowd and it avoids the madness of crowds there's theory behind it. And the larger group process supports better understanding, trust, and alignment because 
we're actually able to discuss the details. We're able to discuss the questions. We're able to ask questions. So there's a key point of discernment here in terms of how we deal with specialists and specialist information. The collective process is about bringing all the assumptions and options to light and then choosing the best option. And I think we also need to underline that we should, ought to exercise caution and discernment when overriding specialists. The basis of the process is understanding first and then alignment along criteria, issues, options and assumptions. And if you don't know, if you're not interested and you disbelieve and you feel it's not important, then perhaps it's best to trust the others who have more interest and better understanding. Because if we're approaching the table without interest, with disbelief, and with believing that it's not important, then I think it makes sense to trust the others who do believe that it's interesting, important, etc. So if we're doing the opposite, we might assume that that's holacracy which is, well, the team has this discrete domain, it's its territory, and they make decisions. But is it? Because where does one domain end and where do others begin? And how do we ensure that we don't make decisions that impact detrimentally on other interests, other elements within the organisation? The fact is, we can't, and that's why this is an effective process. So the solutions are to focus on intention, structure and process and not personality or communication style. If we see everything as personality or communication style and it's upsetting to us or offensive to us, then we're going to be creating our own world of drama. So it's very important to understand the processes and to apply the processes and to support the chair in applying the processes. So here's how it should work. We've got our intention, our processes, our structures, and the team deeply understand what this is all about. And they take ownership of that. If we have the meeting again between marketing and the chair, and there seems to be some projection going on, then the role of the chair is to focus on the team agreements and the processes. And if that conversation can't take place, then ultimately they have to take it to the group. And we've also got another option if we have someone who is effective in the role as the mediator counsellor, that they can participate as well and help to understand the communications issues going on and help to support realignment. So some of the behavioural issues or assumptions coming in can include things like the processes don't apply to me or they don't apply to this situation, surely. Well, where's the exception in the conscious co-creation tools? It's not there. They apply to everyone all the time. Another potential issue coming up could be things like repeating conversations to the group with imprecision. And that means for something to be precise, it needs to have context and nuance. And we need to be very careful about this because the way that we receive conversations can mean that we're just picking up on certain things and then reading interpretations into them. And it's very easy to assume that someone who's talking about a certain thing has another agenda in mind or something like that. And that may or may not be the case. But the fact is that if we're repeating conversations to the group with imprecision, without the context and nuance, for whatever reason, then we're doing the other person a disservice and we're also doing ourselves a disservice. Because if it subsequently emerges that actually what was repeated to the group as a political kind of conversation without the context and nuance, then that could be seen to be acting in a Machiavellian manner. So we need to be very, very careful about how we repeat things back to the group and to try and bring precision to that process. 
We also need to watch out for projections, which I'm defining as no questions or weaponized questions, which is assumptions plus emotional content. Another issue that we need to watch out for is spiritual superiority, which is the subtle languaging of I'm right, or you're wrong, or you're an idiot. And that's usually accompanied by labeling such as old paradigm, division, and separation. Have a think about that one and how that really works. The next one is cooking up things and coming to the table with righteous wrath. In other words, letting our programs run riot. If we can't come to the table with a position of calmness, neutrality, bringing questions and focusing time and again on intention, structure and process, then we're bringing our emotional demons to the table. And that impacts the group. And finally, we need to think about that issue raised by the five aspects of truthfulness versus agreeableness. What's the difference? Because if the assumption is that people are highly agreeable, then that's going along with another assumption that they're not being entirely truthful. But equally, we could say that we all know of examples where people are very truthful, but it's weaponized. It's weaponized in a way that the truth is used to batter people with. And so what's the balance point of those? It's bringing your truth to the table, but in a neutral, straightforward manner. And if people then receive that with hurt feelings and delicate egos, etc., then you have to ask, where does the problem lie? So I think that one is worth unpacking and exploring in detail as well. Here's some more assumption issues. One is you're responsible for my feelings and emotional reactions. And on that basis, the subtext is I'm not. And the result of bringing that lot of emotional baggage to the table is that effectively what it means is that your truth has to dance around my feelings and programs or it can't be stated. Truthfulness versus agreeableness again. And it also means that emotions rule. And on the one hand, we are veering from the holding hands and skipping through the flowers analogy. And on the other hand, we're interpolating Mad Max into the thing because of our wounded feelings. So another one is that emotional communication is paramount and that's predicated on behaviorism, which is the root of all totalitarianism. It's telling people how to behave. It is wanting to control their behavior and using one or another method of manipulation to make sure it happens. And unfortunately, if you're into that kind of stuff, then it tends to give the truth a damn good kicking. Another issue is image versus contents. And the whole point of these exercises is to align them. And the contents is the most important thing. The contents is back to things like structure and process. Everything else is presentation. And underlying a lot of these issues are things like viewing the world with archetypes and having feelings of superiority or inferiority. And both of those are flip sides of the same coin. And the only way to get around that is to treat everybody in the same way. Don't look up to people. Don't look down to people. Don't feel threatened when people tell you their truth. If they're coming in with a bad attitude and emotional tantrums and all the rest of it, well, that's their problem. But if we're adults, we don't need to get engaged in that kind of thing. So here are the critical points. We can deal with all of that as long as the team can own and understand their processes and team agreements. If they don't, then Houston, you've got a problem. And that means then it all comes down to the chair. And if they're not doing their job or they're not, they're not able to, or they're not supported in drawing focus to the processes and team agreements, then that's pretty much 
your last line of defense destroyed. The next one is that the team mediator should be able to step in before this, the mediator counselor, and then if they are unsuited or they're not doing their job, then there's another key chess piece taken off the board. And ultimately, I think we need to consider the measure of an organization is in the fact of the questions that can't be asked. Do we really want to be in that kind of organization? And the last one is the super toxic behaviors of spiritual superiority and labeling. So we need to understand that, you know, we're going to come across conflicts in values, people, emotions, programs versus processes and team agreements, agreeableness, emotions, personality versus truthfulness and specialization and domain ownership versus sharing and using the collective consciousness. And this is worth thinking about very carefully, as is all of the information in this presentation, because if we get it wrong, then what we're starting to do is invert, not just get wrong, but invert the whole principles of the conscious co-creation tools. So what are the lessons and observations here? First and foremost, always understand, embody, and apply the processes and team agreements. There's another question which arises here, which is, is it possible to have a collective Hall of Mirrors experience? Well, I'd like to share a story from my management consulting days here, where a group of about six of us went into the UK's top household paper products manufacturer to do an accounts receivables exercise. So accounts receivables is where the money due into a company is typically due within a period such as 30 days. That would be normal. So the measurement of the performance of the accounts receivables is what percentage of that money actually comes in within or on 30 days. And we were working with one of the top companies in the UK and that over 98% of the money due to that company came in on time every month. That is superhuman level of performance. It's quite outstanding. But when you consider that probably expenditure of this company was represented in several pounds per man, woman and child in the UK, we're talking about a lot of money. And it was very important to get as much of that money in as possible because then you're able to defray your costs and you may even be able to earn interest on it, certainly in those days. So we came to our conclusions and our conclusions were quite simple that the issue was that this was a stellar department. It was doing absolutely world-class work, but the problems came with the 2% of the cases where the wrong things were being delivered in the wrong way at the wrong time and the customers were upset about that. And as a result, quite naturally, they didn't want to pay their bills. And what was happening then was that this was being compounded by this credit control department and they were actually going out and undertaking threats and legal action against their customers when actually it was their mistake. And we analyzed the figures and we did the research and this was the conclusion that we came up with. And of course, then you've got a double whammy, which is the damage to the customer relationship. So we'd worked out the problem, we'd worked out the solution, and there was every chance that we could nudge the accounts receivables from 98% to over 99%. And that would have delighted the company. That's what we were there for. So we followed up the process after our own analysis of talking to all of the staff. And the first staff member came in and we did the interview and we said, how do you think you perform as a department? We're absolutely brilliant, of course. Yes, we're a great company. And um, okay, can you think of why, you know, the, there is, is a sticky point with the last 2%? Oh, it's difficult customers, problem customers. Okay. Anything else you want to add? Yes. Don't talk to this person. 
they're a troublemaker. Hmm. Okay. That was interesting. And the long and the short of it is that we interviewed all the people in the department, but after that one, we decided to save that person till the last. And at least another two or three people came up with the same thing. Don't talk to this person. They're a troublemaker. So we were very much looking forward to interviewing this last person. And we interviewed them and we spoke to them about it. And we said, what do you perceive is going on? They said, well, we're a brilliant department, brilliant company. But the problem is we don't believe our customers and we can and do make mistakes. Other departments can make mistakes. We can deliver damaged goods, the wrong thing at the wrong time. We have upset customers and then we don't believe them. And then we take them to court. And we said, you're absolutely right. So there was one person in this department effectively acting as a whistleblower and it got them hatred from the other people for speaking their truth. But the fact was, they were right. So it is possible to have a collective hall of mirrors experience. It happens when people assume, they don't ask questions, and they project on other people instead of asking questions. The next lesson and observation is that the responsibility for processes means that the chair is usually a center for projection. Why? Because they're always the one who is ultimately backstopping the whole situation. If the group isn't looking after and embodying their structure and processes, then the chair has to, that's their job. And unfortunately, that sets them up for the Hall of Mirrors experience, because typically it's not just one person having the projection issues and the emotion issues going on. It's typically two, three, four or more. That's normal. You need to be aware of this. So in that situation, it's a challenge to maintain a position of neutrality and exceptionally so if the group doesn't recognize the role of their processes and the chair in supporting them and what they're trying to do. And if we're viewing things as emotion, as drama, as programs, then they're going to get projected on. The final lesson and observation is be careful who acts as the group mediator and counselor because they have to be up to the job and they have to do the job and they can't be the most triggered person in the room. So our focus points are embedded in the conscious co-creation tools. Be impeccable with your word. That means always. And it also means stick to the team agreements and stick to the processes. Under every situation. It says don't take anything personally. And we could follow that up by saying, ask questions. Because the next one is, don't make assumptions. Always do your best. And if you're going to assume anything, assume that anything is possible, but also assume everyone else does their best too. Be skeptical, but learn to listen. Because if you can't learn to listen, then People can't bring questions to the group. You can't re-establish alignment. You can't actually find out what another person is really trying to do or really thinking. And then once you understand all of these principles and tools, take responsibility for yourself, for your actions, for your emotions, and for dealing with the team issues because the process only works if it, the team, the chair and the intention are supported. We need to be acutely aware of interpretation, assumptions leading to projections. Because the fact is, although we love to have quick shortcuts and believe that we know what other people are thinking and trying to do, here's the fact, we don't all think alike. And that means you can't know how others think or feel or how they rationalize things ever. Think very carefully if you wish to tamper with the system, the structure or the processes, because if you don't understand them, how can you change them? How can you improve them? 
and understand the difference between judgment as discernment and judgment as condemnation. So here are potential breaking points. The discussion of structures and processes is moved to personality projections. Frequently focused on the chair. That's happened so many times over the last 23 years, I probably can't count them. The next one is no questions, or we avoid reasonable questions, conversations and rational discussion. If we do that, what are we replacing it with? Accusations? Projections? Guesses? Assumptions? So remember, we have choices, including owning our emotional responses and our assumptions. Our emotions do not and should not depend on other people. If you think otherwise, you really need to think again. Here's an example of that. Have you seen the footage of people at American airports where there is a delay to a plane and one person is going absolutely bananas? Do you think that's down to the delay in the plane? Or do you think it's something going on with that particular person as opposed to all of the rest of the people? Because all of the rest of the people are going through the same experience. So our emotions and our reactions do not and should not depend on other people. None of us knows what other people are thinking. We can only do our best and it's best not to guess. It's best to assume nothing or only that other people are doing their best and consider the consequences of losing your map and compass. So as a reminder, here are our key roles, the members, the chair, the administrator who helps to save people time and keep things organized and the counselor mediator. And this is typically what happens in the projection situation. And if the members aren't recognizing what's going on and looking after their structure and processes, then there's very little hope that things are going to work. And at the very least, it's going to take a lot of stress and a lot of time and a lot of energy. So in conclusion, it's vital to focus on intention, structure and process, not personality and behaviorism. It's vital to recognize the importance of these items and to understand how they work and why they work, which is the theory. It's vital to understand your responsibilities to the team and its structure and processes. And it's vital to understand the potential consequences of getting things wrong or inverted. And it's worth considering making all members sign the team agreement because how else do we get people to consider them and take them seriously? And I'd encourage anyone to watch these videos as well. We can never change anyone's perspective, thoughts, communication style, or emotional programs. All we have is alignment on team agreements and processes, and that should be our focus. Only you can change your perspective, your thoughts, your communication style, though that's difficult, or your emotional programs. So you choose. If you want this, what you're really probably heading for is drama, us and them, emotions, programs, inferiority and superiority, or we can have team agreements, intention, structure and processes. What we look at is what we see, is what we get. Going further, there are free documents, resources on MOSO. And as a reminder, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. And if you want to change things, the place to start is typically yourself. Thank you for watching.